Welcome, everyone, to Alumni Weekend and to our Head Games discussion. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. My name is Stephanie McBride, and I'm a 2009 graduate of the College of Arts and Sciences and the College of Communication. And I am a member of your Boston University Alumni Council. The Alumni Council is the leadership group for the Alumni Association. We draw upon the expertise and dedication of talented alumni from all BU colleges and schools. Our council members serve, with, serve as an important voice to university leadership and work to engage alumni in meaningful ways with BU and with one another. The Alumni Council is pleased to have you here today and we look forward to celebrating BU with all of you. This afternoon's session features Dr. Robert Stern of the School of Medicine, who will discuss the newest research out of the School of Medicine and the Center for the Study of Traumatic Encephalopathy on Repetitive Brain Trauma in Sports and the Military. Dr. Stern is a professor of neurology and neurosurgery at the School of Medicine, where he serves as the director of the clinical core of the BU Alzheimer's Disease Center, one of only 29 centers around the country funded by the National Institutes of Health. NIH. He is also a co-founder of the Center for the Study of Traumatic Encephalopathy at BU, where he oversees clinical research focusing on the long-term effects of repetitive brain trauma in athletes. Dr. Stern's other major areas of funded research include assessment and treatment of Alzheimer's disease, driving in dementia, thyroid brain relationships, and the cognitive effects of chemotherapy in the elderly. He has published on various aspects of cognitive assessment and is the senior author of many widely used neuropsychological tests. He has received several NIH and other national and local grants, has published over 250 journal articles, chapters, and abstracts, and is a fellow of both the American Neuropsychiatric Association and the National Academy of Neuropsychology. He is a member of the Medical and Scientific Advisory Committee of the Massachusetts and New Hampshire Center of the Alzheimer's Association, and is on the medical advisory boards of Sports Legacy Institute and the National Graves Disease Foundation. Dr. Stern has served on several national grant review committees and is on the editorial boards of several medical and scientific journals. In addition to being a researcher and administrator, he is a clinician, focusing on the diagnosis of neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's, as well as a teacher and a mentor for graduate students medical students, neurology residents, and postdoctoral fellows in geriatrics, neurosurgery, and neuropsychology. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Robert Stern. Thank you very much, Stephanie, and thank you all for being here. I'm going to make that bad sound again. Ready? If anyone falls asleep, I'm going to do that over and over again. Um, it's really fantastic to be here, and I just want to thank uh, all of you from out of town, especially, for coming in for these events. How many people are here from out of town? Fantastic. This is where I could do like a Jay Leno and start mentioning towns and see who <laughs> applauds. Um, one of the, the very cool things I get to do in this new area of research uh, is to hang out with professional athletes, which is really neat, especially my kids really like it. And I've got to, I've got to admit, I like it too. But I, the other day I was um, talking to uh, a couple or overhearing a couple of former NFL players talking, and one of them was saying to the other, you know, I was in Boston um, having, you know, participating in Dr. Stern's research, and I went to this fantastic place for lunch. The food and service were great. And so the other guy next to him said, oh, really? What was the name of it? I'd love to go. And the first guy said, I, I don't remember. That's why I'm here seeing Dr. Stern. <laughs> but, but wait, what do you call that long-stemmed flower that people give on special occasions? And the other guy said, you mean a rose? And he said, that's it. And he turned to his wife and he said, Rose, what's the name of the place we went to the other day? <laughs> All right, now I can leave. Thank you. Um, I'm starting with humor because, as you'll hear through today's talk, one needs some humor to deal with this on a daily basis and to um, deal with the complexity of the issues and the sadness of some of the individuals' um, uh, cases that I, that I deal with. Um, but I also just want to make today fun for you. So I am going to throw in a little bit of humor throughout the talk but hopefully also uh, some good amount of information. 
Um, please feel free to interrupt with important questions or silly questions or um, uh, just comments of your own. Um, if I'm going to address things later, I'll tell you to you know, be patient and I'll bring it up later. Um, and, but we will also hopefully have a little bit of time for a Q&A at the end. Let me um, tell you first about our center, the Center for the Study of Traumatic Encephalopathy. Um, this is a neat affiliation between a nonprofit organization, Sports Legacy Institute, and the university. And we started it in 2008 uh, with some initial support from Dean Antman from the School of Medicine, as well as several departments and programs in the School of Public Health and the School of Medicine. Uh, and we started with just you know, a little bit of support and as you'll hear through this story today, it has made a tremendous amount of difference. Um, we are closely tied to that Alzheimer's Disease Center that you heard mentioned before um, because we're, we're talking about two neurodegenerative diseases here, Alzheimer's disease, for which the center is, that center is funded, and chronic traumatic encephalopathy, a disease that you're going to hear about through the rest of this afternoon, another disease that's like Alzheimer's, but completely different in many ways. When we started this center, the goal was to try to understand the long-term effects of repetitive brain trauma. In, in particular, when we started, we were thinking it was just concussions that were the issue. And so it was really a concussion type of research program looking at what happens when you have too many concussions, what happens later on. But as you'll hear, things have changed. In order to tell this story, I need to give appropriate honor um, and recognition to the really in the key people, um, much, much more important than I am in this story. Uh, starting with Dr. Cantu. Bob Cantu is a neurosurgeon. Um, some of you may have seen him on Katie yesterday. Um, if you didn't, you should. He's, he's, he's the guy out there in the world uh, when it comes to sports concussion. He's the guru, the, the king of concussion um, in pretty much every way. Uh, next to him is uh, Anne McKee. Dr. McKee is a neuropathologist, also trained as a neurologist and an internist. Um, she is the person who looks at people's brains after they die and diagnoses them with all types of uh, disorders. Uh, she and I work together on the Alzheimer's Disease Center. She oversees the brains after people die. I oversee the brains before they die. Um, so we meet somewhere in between. And then the big guy. The big guy's name is Chris Nowinski. Chris Nowinski has a very interesting history. He was a Harvard football player, a really good Harvard football player. He was all Ivy. He was a defensive tackle. And then he became the only Harvard graduate, the only Ivy League graduate, to become a pro wrestler in the WWE. You like his crimson H on his behind? Um, he was known as Chris Harvard, despised on the circuit because he was magna cum laude from Harvard. Um, watch this. I love that line, don't you? So I hate to break it to you, for all of you pro wrestler fans, um, it's fake. I know you're, you're devastated. But you know what? It's not completely fake. These are athletes. These are really large athletes doing these kind of stunts on a daily basis. Things go wrong on a daily basis, and they get really badly hurt. Well, after one of these, um, Chris um, had to retire due to really bad symptoms of incredible headache, of night terrors, of awful memory, of anxiety. And he went from doctor to doctor to doctor, and everyone said, oh, yeah, it's just depression. It's just anxiety. You'll, you'll, you know, here's some medicine. You'll feel better. Nothing helped. And it wasn't until he saw Dr. Cantu as his eighth referral when Dr. Cantu said, Chris, how many concussions have you had? And he said, 
I, you know, I've never been diagnosed with a concussion. And then he described what a concussion was, and Chris said, you're kidding. And then he said, your symptoms that you have right now are something called post-concussion syndrome. And it was due to getting hit over and over and over again. He didn't like that. And you don't mess with a guy six foot five and 280 pounds. But he's also that Harvard graduate who was an intellectual who said, you know, I've got to do something about this. So what do you do? You do research and you write a book. And he wrote a book called Head Games. And he then founded with Dr. Cantu this nonprofit organization called Sports Legacy Institute with the aim of changing the world of sports to make sports safer. And I, I don't say this about too many people in the world, but he's one of those few people who single-handedly has made a tremendous difference in the world. He's changed the world of sports and awareness of brain trauma. Oh, oh my gosh. You want to watch it again? Let's watch that again. One more time. Still Here we stopping. Go. Oh, oh my gosh. Now how old they are? Seven, seven, eight. Still st These are high school guys. These are pros. What's a concussion? Well, to use the true definition, the, the currently used definition of a concussion, it's a temporary change in the functioning of the, of the brain cells that's caused by a biomechanical hit to the body or the head that makes the brain move around inside that hard skull, resulting in symptoms. I'll tell you what the symptoms are and describe it in more detail in a minute. Contrary to a lot of misconception, a concussion does not require a loss of consciousness. Actually, maybe one out of a hundred has any loss of consciousness at all. It is by definition a non-structural injury, meaning you can't see it on typical scans. You can't see it on a CAT scan or an MRI. It is not a bruise to the brain. It's not like you get hit here and the front part of your brain has a bruise to it. That's not how it happens. This is what happens. When your brain, that is the consistency of like jello mold, moves around inside the, the skull, it's surrounded by cerebrospinal fluid. And so there's enough room, jiggle room, to be able to actually bend and stretch. And it's that stretching inside the brain when you get hit like this that stretches the axons, the connections between the brain cells. And when that happens, it results in this huge crisis, a metabolic crisis in the brain cells that requires time to rest. And in order to rest and in order to recover, you need true, true rest. And concussions do recover. With appropriate rest and with appropriate recovery, the symptoms of concussions will go away. But think about a teenager, because that's where a lot of concussions happen. Think about a teenager trying to get them to not do texting, to not do video games, to not watch TV, to not even read, and to not go to school. That's really hard. But for a short amount of time at least, until the symptoms go away, that is what's required. Not for months. That's worse. Research actually shows someone just stays in bed and does nothing for two months, that's going to actually have a dramatic negative effect on them. But at the initial time of the concussion, that kind of do-nothing rest, cognitive and physical rest, is critical and needs to continue until the symptoms dissipate. 
And then there's a stepwise return. You add a little bit of music, a little bit of reading, a little bit of walking around the block unt until you can do that without symptoms returning. Then you add more, step by step. And eventually, you're back to full recovery and hopefully everything's fine. But what is a concussion? How will you recognize this in yourself, in your patients, in your kids, in whomever? Well, it is this kind of hodgepodge of symptoms uh, that we all experience in all different times of the day, life, whatever. But if any of these things happen after you've hit your head or your body and your, that brain has moved around inside your skull, it's a concussion. Things like headache, feeling in a fog, depression, nausea, poor memory, getting a ding seeing stars, getting your bell rung, that is a concussion. It's not just, oh, I just got dinged, or I just had you know, a, a bell ringer. I had a brain injury. That's what a concussion is. It is a brain injury. But very few of these things actually result in loss of consciousness. How's it diagnosed? Well, for now, it's a real easy and hard thing. It's easy because if you hit your body or your head and your brain moved around and you have these symptoms afterwards, that's pretty much what it is. But you have to make sure it's nothing worse or nothing less or something that's mimicking it or masking it. And so you need to see a doctor and you need to have a good clinical evaluation and that has to be based on um, uh, a neurological examination, on balance testing, on a cognitive assessment, but most importantly, figuring out if there are symptoms. Sometimes people are trying to do these quick things on a sideline uh, or in the military theater to be able to say, aha, right at the time did someone have a concussion. Well, there's one problem in that the symptoms might not develop till the next day, but also these quick sideline things just might mix things dramatically and some of them just aren't appropriate, kind of like this one. Um, I don't find this too appropriate. Does anyone have any difficulty? Anyone have any visual problems so I should describe it? Can people see? All right. So um, then in some people, in some cases, typically when there isn't adequate rest, something called post-concussion syndrome can occur. And this is where there's prolonged or persistent symptoms, including things like depression, feeling in a fog, kind of hazy poor concentration, difficulty with memory. And that stuff can last for months, sometimes a year or more. And it's hard to treat. It's just symptomatic treatment. But the reason why I said before that when we started our center's research thinking that it was just going to be concussions, that was just the beginning. Because concussions are just the tip of the iceberg. Because there's something that we refer to as subconcussive blows. And this is when there's, again, impact to the brain that's bad enough to cause those brain cells to misfunction, to, to, to kind of not do what they're supposed to do. But there may not be immediate symptoms. There may not be that confusion or seeing stars or the feeling in a fog or whatever or headache. But think of this. There are some positions like, let's say, a lineman in football where <coughs> They get down in a three-point stance every play, every game, every practice, and they hit their helmets against their opponent. Do you know what helmets were developed for? Anyone? To protect against skull fracture. And they do a superb job at protecting skull fracture, and they have saved countless number of lives because of that. But guess what? They don't do anything to protect against a concussion. Nothing. Your brain is still moving inside. And in fact, some people maybe think that they're protected and they're invincible by having this huge, hard encasement around their head. So think about that lineman. Every play, every game, every practice, you know what they're doing? They're making their brains go like that. And the amount of force that's occurring is around 20 to 30 G every time. Here's a scary one in soccer, heading in soccer. 
those big headings when the ball's being kicked from, let's say, the goalie and it's going down like that in your head, no matter how good you are, that's around 15 to 20 G. Let's put this in perspective. A car going 35 miles per hour into a brick wall is 20 G. Go back to your physics, physics class way back when. Now you're, you're walking around BU and you're having all these kind of, oh no, do you remember physics? I failed physics. Mass times acceleration is what force is, is what G is. Mass times acceleration. People are getting bigger and faster. Our athletes in the last 20, 30 years are getting bigger and faster. Mass times acceleration. And so these hits, 1,000, 1,500 a season, at 15, 20, 25 G, sometimes greater, that don't result in symptoms are still doing something to the brain. And these subconcussive blows are happening in kids, too. So, for example, some colleagues of ours at Purdue University did this really interesting study. What they did was they put these accelerometer gizmos inside the helmets of their high school players so they could measure the amount of G-force whenever they get hit. But before the season, all the kids had a baseline cognitive test that some of you might be familiar with, IMPACT. It's used all over the place now. It's a cognitive computerized test. And then that's used to be able to see how you're doing after you might get hit later in the season. But they also had something called a functional magnetic resonance imaging technique, which is a, a, an MRI, but it's a way to measure the physiological functioning of the brain. And then the season started, and they looked at anyone who had symptomatic concussions, and they pulled them, and they weren't allowed to return to play or to activity or school until they were better. You guys want to come in? Come on in. Um, but they also looked at the kids who didn't have symptomatic concussions, but who had big hits based on those accelerometers. And so they had no symptoms, but they still had the hits, so they can refer to those as the subconcussive group. And they gave all of those kids, the ones who were symptomatic concussion and the ones who were asymptomatic, repeat cognitive assessment and repeat physiological assessment. And guess what? The kids who had the subconcussive blows were worse. Their brains were worse than the kids who had symptomatic concussions and who were pulled. Why? Because they were pulled. They were allowed to rest. Another study by Brolio and colleagues this past year found that high school players received on average, average, 652 hits to the head in excess of 15 G per season. One kid received 2,235 hits over that amount in one season. Dr. Cantu as I said, is the king of concussion. This is kind of a, a, a plug for um, his book that just was released this week. I guess that's why he was on Katie and he's doing this national book tour. But uh, it's not really a plug for his book as much as a plug for anyone who's interested in kids and sports concussion. Uh, this is a must read. All right, all of what I just said was kind of preliminary to get us all up to date on what happens when you get hit. But now the rest of the talk is focusing on the real area of our research at BU in our center, and that is the long-term consequences of repeated concussions and subconcussive blows. And so what I'm talking about is that after the initial symptoms go away, if there ever were any, after post-concussion syndrome recovers, if there ever was post-concussion syndrome, in some people, a progressive brain disease develops. A progressive brain disease, not brain injury. This is not, we'll look at this for a minute. Yeah, boxing. The goal of boxing is to induce brain injury. 
That's the goal of it. And so it's fallen by the wayside a little bit, but it sure is still around, and things like mixed martial arts have, has grown. And for a long time now, for a long, long time, we've known that people like him, anyone know who this is? No? Ten extra points for the man over there. It's Cassius Clay's before he changed his name. This was just a trick question. However, we all know, you know, you, you, you look at this guy and there's that kind of dull face, the kind of, you know, hard to get words out, kind of, oh no, that's Bush. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was in Texas giving one of these talks a few months ago. So beforehand, I was going back and forth, back and forth. Do I use this joke or do I not use this joke? And I stupidly used the joke. And there was one Northeasterner in the front row who looked at me, smiled, and said, oh, you shouldn't have. <laughs> we have known for a long time that boxers, because of that repetitive, repetitive blow to the head, don't fare too well. We've known actually since 1928 when an article in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association came out, the prestigious JAMA, it was entitled Punch Drunk, <coughs> referring to the long-term consequences of boxers. What happens in boxers? So terms in this prestigious journal to describe these guys were goofy, slug nutty, went on to say that many of them, if they lived long enough, required institutionalization in an asylum. In 1937, the term dementia pugilistica was first used to describe this dementia, this impaired functioning that develops in boxers years later. So dementia of pugilists, of fighters. We now know, though, that boxers aren't the only people who develop this disease. The brain has no idea what's hitting it. But in the last 30, 40 years, many other activities in our culture have resulted in this increased amount of hits to the head. And now we're starting to see this dementia pugilistica in other people. But the term now that's been used since around the 1950s and beyond is chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy. It's the same thing, though, as dementia pugilistica. So if you've heard about punch drunk, if you think about people like Muhammad Ali, we're talking about the same thing. What is it? It's a progressive neurodegenerative disease that is indeed similar to Alzheimer's, but it's wholly unique. And it's believed to be caused by repetitive brain trauma. Repetitive brain trauma, including concussions, but also, very importantly, subconcussive hits. What is it not? It is not prolonged post-concussion syndrome. It is not the cumulative effect of brain injuries. It's not like you have one, you have another, you have another, then you keep getting worse each time you get one. No, it's not that. In fact, the symptoms begin years or decades after the exposure to that repetitive brain trauma. It's a disease that starts because of the trauma. And as more and more brain cells get destroyed, the symptoms begin, and it continues to get worse through life. What does it look like clinically? Well, we have a pretty good idea. Dr. McKee and I wrote a, a review with the rest of our group a few years ago on the world's literature at the time of uh, dementia pugilistica, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and got an understanding of that. But since then, we've also now had, it's actually way more than 65, confirmed cases of CTE neuropathologically. So we know they have it. And what happens, you'll hear about this in a few minutes, is Dr. McKee and her group look at the brains of people whose brains have been donated to our center and does the examination and will diagnose CTE when it's there. And while she's doing that, blind to the diagnosis, I'm on the phone interviewing all the loved ones and reviewing all the medical records. 
one after another after another, getting these incredible stories of these people who hit their heads earlier in life and then they started developing these symptoms from this disease. Several cases of suicide have been seen or suicidal behavior. Several cases of substance abuse or other addictions. Typically the symptoms begin in one's 30s or 40s, sometimes a little later. It's a slowly progressive disease. As more and more brain cells get hurt, more symptoms continue to occur. In the early stage, there are some cognitive difficulties. Most profoundly are memory problems, the inability to learn new things. And then something we refer to as executive dysfunction. Problems with planning, organization, judgment, juggling more than one task at a time. Then there's behavioral difficulties. This is perhaps the most pro pronounced problem in the disease of difficulty with controlling one's impulses, having a short fuse, people being described as out of control, being irritable, agitated, often violent. And then there's mood changes with depression, suicidality, but also frequently apathy, the lack of real emotion, the withdrawal of, of emotion and connection. Later on in the course of the disease, there can be some motor difficulties, including poor speech, gait problems, falling. A subset of people with this disease get something that is clinically ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. And then everyone with the disease, if they live long enough, seems to develop a full-blown dementia. And what does that mean? What's dementia? No matter who I talk to, I always have to talk about what's dementia because no one really knows the difference between dementia and something like Alzheimer's disease. People use them interchangeably. Dementia is really just a grab bag clinical description when someone has memory problems and other cognitive difficulties that get in the way of daily life. That's all it is. It is not an illness. It is not a disease. Dementia is just the outcome of a disease. It's kind of like having a fever. If you have a fever, what does it tell you? You're sick. That's all. You're sick. It doesn't tell you what's wrong. It doesn't tell you how to do something about it. Same thing with dementia. It means there's something wrong with your brain, but it doesn't say what's causing it. And so brain diseases cause dementia, like chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia, but CTE is another brain disease that can cause it. And in fact, there's been a lot of confusion in the public media about football players developing early Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, it's not really that. It's probably CTE that these football players are developing. But if there are no early symptoms, earlier than let's say age 60, it may indeed be Alzheimer's. Why? Because the numbers tell us that you know, Alzheimer's is the most common cause. One out of eight people has Alzheimer's disease over the age of 65. Over the age of 85, one out of two, 50% of the population will develop Alzheimer's dementia. But this is a different thing. This is a disease that's caused by repeated blows to the brain. And like Alzheimer's disease and other similar neurodegenerative diseases, right now, CTE can only be diagnosed after death. And my colleague, Dr. McKee, has seen more cases of CTE than anyone in the entire world. This is, again, way old numbers. We don't really update them regularly until we have publications come out. But it's been well over 100 cases examined, well over 80 cases of CTE diagnosed. That's her with her brains. I just like to show that to make people go, ew. <laughs> this is a good point in, in, in this talk to let you know that both Dr. McKee and I are big football fans. <laughs> just keep that in mind. Okay? What is CTE? I'm going to give you a little bit of science, but then talk about some people. CTE is a a uh, brain disease that's characterized by an abundance of an abnormal form of a protein called tau. And tau is a normal, normally seen inside the brain cells. It keeps the axons kind of strong and firm. Um, but in this disease, they go awry and they clump together and they become these tangled fibers inside the nerve cells. Um, so these are the types of things that we look at. They're called neurofibrillary tangles, um, uh, neuropil threads, glial tangles. 
And this, dis this disturbance of the brain, this accumulation of this, this protein tau, is widespread all over the brain and eventually. But early on, this is important to think about, two parts of the brain especially get affected early on. The frontal lobes, where behavioral control exists, where personality is, and where executive functioning is, planning, organization, multitasking, things like that. And then what we refer to as the medial temporal lobes. Inside the middle of the brain, kind of deep in here, there are a couple areas of the brain called the amygdala and the hippocampus. The hippocampus is necessary for making new memories, hence the memory problem. But the amygdala is an interesting thing. That's where our emotions come from. That's where rage comes from, impulses come from. So think of that. If those are the two early parts of the brain affected, that's a bad combination. What does it look like? Well, these are just slices from Dr. McKee. These are slices of the brain like this, where it's not under a microscope at all at this point, two different slices of the same brain, but it's been stained with a special stain that turns brown if there's tau, if there's that bad tau. So everywhere you see brown, you shouldn't be seeing brown if the person was healthy. And in fact, where you're seeing it on this slide are the frontal lobes and the medial temporal lobe, with this area being where the amygdala is. All right, let's talk about some cases, make this human. The first case of a brain that was, do, that was donated to our center, the first case of a brain donated to our center was that of John Grimsley. John died sadly at the age of 45. He was a very successful NFL player, was a pro bowler in 1988. He was a linebacker. Linebackers are probably the number two position for repetitive hits to the head. He had remembered eight concussions in his career. I'd probably multiply that by a thousand. But that's what he, he talked about. A lot of these guys don't remember any concussions. But when he was talking to his wife before he died, he was, he, she remembered him saying, I think I had eight concussions. After his NFL career, he was a very successful hunter-fishing guide. He knew his way around weapons, firearms. But for the five years prior to his death, he was showing this progressive decline in functioning, memory problems. He actually forgot one night that the family was going out to dinner to celebrate his son's proposing to his wife. He forgot that his son was proposing to his wife his future wife. He also started having this awful short fuse, something he never had before. His wife rem just rem remembered him just being out of control. Then sadly, one night, he was cleaning his gun in his home. He was alone. He had no alcohol or drugs in his system. There was no evidence of suicide. He forgot to take the ammunition out of his gun while he was cleaning it and accidentally shot himself in the chest. This is John Grimsley's brain. This is a, a section of his brain. On the top, it's not under a microscope. On the bottom is a part of that brown stuff under the microscope. He's 45 years old. The brown stuff is all disease. To put it in perspective, on the left is a healthy 65-year-old brain. That's what it should look like even at age 65 or 70 or 75. To put it in greater perspective, on the right is that of a boxer. He's actually a world-class boxer. 73, he died with dementia pugilistica. He was institutionalized um, at a, a long-term care facility with a long bout, so to speak, of dementia. Look at that. A 45-year-old football player, a 73-year-old boxer with dementia. It's the same thing, almost as bad. The second brain donated to us was that of Tom McHale, who just coincidentally also died at age 45. He was a nine-year NFL veteran lineman. Remember, every play, every game, every practice, 1,000, 1,500 hits per year. Played for the Buccaneers. He was a bright guy. He went to Cornell. That's where he met his wonderful wife, Lisa. Um, Lisa's dad is actually a BU School of Medicine grad. Um, Tom, after he 
had, he finished his NFL career, had a very successful career in the Tampa Bay area as a restaurant owner. Wonderful father of three, terrific husband, until, oh sorry, this is a critical part. This blew us away because we were studying concussions. He never had any known concussions. In all of those years of play, from childhood, through high school, through college at Cornell, through the NFL, no diagnosed concussions, nothing in any of his medical records, nothing in any of his college or his pro career records. He never complained to his wife. No one ever knew of any concussions. He died due to a drug overdose after a few years of being out of control with narcotics. He couldn't get himself together. Rehab after rehab, people were just dumbfounded. He couldn't get himself together. But his wife, after he died, said, you know, let's, a, let's do something for science. That's what Tom would have wanted. He had no concussions. Let's do donate his brain as a control. He wasn't. He was not a control. Some of you may know this case, Dave Dewerson, very famous member of the Chicago Bears Super Bowl team of 1985. Um, on the left is Dewerson when he was playing. On the right is when he was testifying in Congress and saying that brain trauma in football does not result in any long-term problems. And why was he asked to testify? Because he was on the committee of the NFL Players Association that made the determinations of disability in former players for dementia. And he bought into this storyline from the NFL that there were no long-term consequences. And he denied one after another his brethren disability coverage. He, after his incredible career as a Chicago Bear, uh, went on to be a very successful, very wealthy businessman. Uh, he was a uh, food service provider, um, had millions, and everything fell apart around five years prior to his death at age 50. He lost his businesses. He made awful decisions. He became out of control, had a short fuse, became violent started abusing his wonderful wife, who he never would ever have thought he would. She had to divorce him. He lost it all. He committed suicide last February, a year and a half ago, by shooting himself in the chest. Some of you may have heard of this. He shot himself in his chest in order to save his brain. And he had left text messages and a suicide note saying, please send my brain to what he referred to as the NFL brain bank, us. He knew he had it. And lo and behold, he did. At age 50, he had pretty prominent disease. If this were just pro football players or boxers, I wouldn't be up here talking to you. I show those because they're pretty striking and they were early in the course of our research. But it's not just pros. It's not just football players. In fact, of those 65 or so individuals who we've diagnosed post-mortem, we have seen boxers, but we've also seen people like pro hockey players. Some of you may have heard about some of these guys. There was a wonderful New York Times three-part series last December of, Reggie, of um, uh, Derek Bogard. If you haven't read it, it is one of the best pieces of journalism out there. These guys were all enforcers. These are the fighters on the ice. They weren't just regular hockey players. Of the hockey players who have had CTE, they were all fighters on the ice. But again, it's not just pros. We've seen the disease in people who just played college football, who just played high school football. The game can happen to any player at any level. Owen Thomas grew up 60 miles from Philadelphia playing football since he was nine years old. He said, uh, you know, I might not be the biggest, I might not be the strongest, but I have an ability to hit. And it's when you put strength and height and timing together, you can hit, and he, he enjoyed that contact. 
Owen's talent and drive carried him to the Ivy League. Wrapped up and brought down by Owen Thomas. As a junior defensive end at the University of Pennsylvania, he was elected a team captain this spring. Weeks later, on April 26th, he committed suicide. It hurt my heart to think that I had so misunderstood my own son, that he would go out, that he would call me to wish me happy birthday, and then the next day he'd go out and kill himself. It just felt like a, a real pain in, in a mother's heart. After his death, Owen's parents were contacted by the Sports Legacy Institute at Boston University to donate their son's brain for an ongoing study of head trauma. Owen had talked with us about the gift of life and being an organ donor, and that was really important to him. And we got a call from the Sports Legacy Institute. Would you consider, if possible, donating Owen's brain for this study? Owen didn't have any history of reported or known concussions. He was 21 years old. We really were just thinking this was going to be a healthy looking 21 year old brain. Dr. Robert Stern is part of a research group at Boston University studying the link between repetitive head trauma and neurodegenerative disease. So here we have the pictures of Owen Thomas's brain. After examining Owen's brain, doctors made a startling discovery. At 21 years old, Owen had developed CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Chronic traumatic encephalopathy is a progressive degenerative brain disease that is caused by repetitive blows to the head. No concussions but played from the age of nine on as a lineman. We have no idea if his suicide had anything to do with this disease. There's no way of ever knowing. Probably not. It was at the very early stages of the disease. What was important about his case was that he was only 21 and we found the disease. What's important about his case is he had no known concussions and we found the disease. We've also now seen it in the military. This was a paper that just came out this past May in Science Translational Medicine by BU colleagues, Dr. Goldstein and Dr. McKee and several of us involved, where amongst some other findings, Dr. McKee found CTE in four male military veterans who had a history of repetitive brain trauma, especially blast injury from those IEDs on the side of the road. There are many things that I think you could point to as proof that the humans are not smart. But my personal favorite would have to be that we had to invent the helmet. What was happening apparently was that we were involved in a lot of activities that were cracking our heads. We chose not to avoid doing these activities, but instead to, to come up with some sort of device to help us continue enjoying our head cracking lifestyles. <laughs> the helmet. Even that didn't work because not enough people were wearing them, so we had to come up with the helmet law, which is even stupider. The idea behind the helmet law is to preserve a brain whose judgment is so poor, it does not even try to stop the cracking of the head it's in. It's not really relevant to anything I'm talking about, but. I figured that that was a really good point for some humor, don't, don't you? So we now know the neuropathology from Dr. McKee's work really well. We know what the disease looks like after someone dies. And that was huge because a picture paints a thousand words. Showing those pictures at Congress and TV and whatever, it, it opened people's eyes. Huge impact. But it was only the first step, only the first step toward understanding and treating this disease. And in fact, our impression is that the belief out there is that we know a whole lot more than we do. And in fact, the scientific study of CTE is at its infancy. We know virtually nothing. And yet, look at this is what happens. Over the last two to three years, there's been this unbelievable public awareness from our work in particular. We've been on the cover of like every major magazine. And yet science moves like a snail. I'm sorry, like a tortoise. 
That's how science moves normally. We've only been studying this for three years or so. We have so much more to learn, and yet there's been this impact. Last November, I was stunned to hear that um, Harry's Law, the television show, was doing a piece called Head Games, of all things, but about CTE. And so they had to call upon the BU researcher to come to the stand. <laughs> oh, come on, it's not that funny. These guys are not handsome. <laughs> one week later, one week later, Law and Order SVU. There's often damage. To Dr. McKee's on the top right. That's, That's the, the BU the researcher they called. Impulse control. He's, he's supposed to be a former NFL player who was demented and doing all kinds of impulsive things. More science. The good wife in March. They at least called me ahead of time. They're the only ones who called ahead of time to get some info on their script. And I said, I will as long as I get to meet what's her name, Margulies. And that did not work out. My hero, House. The best diagnostician out there. He did a piece on CTE. He ruled it out, by the way. CSI did a piece on CTE. People can't even pronounce what it stands for, and it's all over the place. This just was released yesterday. It's been known for a long time that banging your head over and over and over and over again can be a bad thing. And I remember I hit the ground and I forgot where we were. I forgot what we were doing in the ring. I forgot what was coming next. I had been gladly exposing myself to repetitive brain trauma concussions for 19 years. Members of the committee, this Friday night over a million kids will take to the football field I'm certain that radical measures are needed for football to continue safely. No matter what kind of helmet you build, it is a dangerous sport. Co-captain of the Penn football team committed suicide. He had 20 areas of his brain that were falling apart that were all going to keep spreading. I know that I've damaged my brain. I don't know where I am 10 years from now. I don't know where I am 20 years from now. After my first concussion, every time I would do heading, I would see stars. I was just like, oh my god, my head hurts so bad. She didn't pull herself out of the game, she didn't tell the coach, and she didn't tell us. And I got hit from behind. People said I was, on, I was on the ice for like four or five minutes. I don't even remember 20 seconds of it. So that's your brain. How much of you are you willing to put on the line for a game? But what's the level of acceptable risk? And what's the level of reasonable reform? If you only have one out of every 100 kids getting diagnosed with a concussion, you're missing them, and your kids are at terrible risk. I might look back and say I wished I had stopped him after this last concussion. He loves to play hockey, and we love watching him play hockey. I believe you just have to protect them as much as you can and, and pray. Um, <clears throat> this just uh, did make its um, premiere yesterday. We actually had the world premiere two nights ago uh, in Boston. Um, anyone remember the movie Hoop Dreams? It's known as the, one of the best documentaries ever made. The, some people, including Roger Ebert, called it the best film of the 1990s. The maker of uh, Hoop Dreams is Steve and James. And Steve James is the filmmaker who just um, did this with us. Um, it's a phenomenal film. It's now uh, going to be seen in select theaters around the country. It'll be in Boston uh, on October 5th. It's now in New York and other places. But the neat thing about this um, is that the producers and the director developed it to not make a lot of money. In fact, it was released simultaneously yesterday on demand 
in all of your cable TV things. You can see it now at home. It's, re it's released on Facebook and YouTube, uh, uh, iTunes, um, also now available. And it's going to be made available to all schools for free. The idea is to make it out there. But it's also thought to be a potential uh, Oscar uh, competitor. Um, I recommend seeing it. You get to see me. <laughs> Instead of some ugly guy who pretended to be me. On <laughs> all right, so we got movies. <laughs> We got TV shows, we got all these things, and yet we don't know the most important answers to the most important questions. Is CTE common? We don't know. Now, I can tell you of the ones that have been made public, 18 of 19 former professional football players' brains have had CTE. It's actually more than that, but is that research? No. It's a biased sample. These are things, brains who are donated from families who are concerned. Now remember, there's a lot of brains who were donated by family members thinking that they didn't have the disease. But it's still a teeny, teeny small sample. That's not research. But what would the denominator be for these pro football players? What if the next 81 that were studied were clean? Would that be enough to say that it was 18 out of 100? Well, two things. Number one is, I can already tell you, it's not that. The majority that come in have the disease. But even if it were 18 out of 100, that's 18%. But again, that's not how you do this kind of research. We need longitudinal research, large sample sizes. We need to be able to have surveillance of what this disease is. Unfortunately, we just found out a couple weeks ago, um, a paper just came out in neurology from the Centers for Disease Control where they looked at former NFL players who played between the, eight, the years of 59 and 88, and they looked at all death records and found that, in summary, people had on their death certificates neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's disease and ALS, four times the rate of same-age U.S. males. And in their paper, they say, you know, probably what was going on is that they had CTE. What other questions? Why do some people get it and some people don't? A lot of people bang their heads every day and don't get this disease. Well, one thing we do know is that every single neuropathologically confirmed case of CTE in our hands, in other groups' hands, in the world's literature has had one thing in common. Every single case has had a history of repetitive brain trauma. Every one, which tells us one thing, that repetitive brain trauma is a necessary ingredient. It's a necessary variable, but it's not sufficient. Lots of people have repetitive brain trauma and don't go on to develop CTE. So what are those additional risk factors? What is it that puts one, people over, one person over the edge to get it and another person not? Are there genetics? Is it the severity and the type of the trauma? Is it the amount of rest in between the hits? Is it the age at the first injury? Dr. Cantu in his book, and now going all around, says there should not be contact sports under the age of 14. Here he is, the most well-respected neurosurgeon concussion guy out there. And he's saying we should not have our kids participate in contact sports under the age of 14. But we don't know that. We don't have those data. We don't know if it's the overall duration of the exposure to the repetitive brain trauma. So how do we answer these questions? Our group does it one way and one way only. We create acronyms. Like this beauty. This is one of my studies, the LEGEND study. It is the worst acronym, actually. <laughs> we have better ones, you'll see soon. But this study is. Um, it, it was put together for us to start examining um, what the clinical course of this disease look like, looks like and what are the potential risk factors. What is it besides repetitive brain trauma and what type of trauma and all those kinds of things that puts people at risk for developing the disease. So what we're doing is we're studying 1,000 athletes. We currently have around 600 enrolled um, just in the last year. 
That's how easy it is for us to get this stuff underway. Age 18 and over, all sports involved, all types of exposure to repetitive brain trauma. And what we're doing is we're studying people every year by telephone. So these people don't have to come to Boston. So we can have this large group and do it in a cost-efficient way. So they participate in a telephone and a web-based assessment. On telephone, there's a formal cognitive assessment. On the web, there's all these um, self-report things of behavior and mood and all these types of things. And we get extensive medical history and sports history and brain trauma history, et cetera. They also then spit in a tube and mail it to us, not just any tube. I mean, we, we actually we send them a special tube so we can look at their saliva and get DNA to do specific genetic testing. And we follow them every year of their life now till they die. And they agree to donate their brains after they pass away. That's one way to do it. But for me, the most important thing to move our research forward and to get these answers is to be able to diagnose the disease during life. We can't wait for people to die. And so this would allow us to do things like differentiate CTE from other neurodegenerative diseases or other causes of these symptoms. We hopefully would be able to prevent some suicide. We'd be able to understand the true prevalence of the disease by being able to do surveillance based on diagnosing people while they're alive. We'd be able to really understand the risk factors for the disease, and hopefully then we'd be able to conduct clinical trials to treat it and maybe ultimately prevent it. And so we started with a pilot neuroimaging study to get this kind of ball rolling. With some colleagues um, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, um, we've been um, doing a bunch of neuroimaging. Uh, we started with a, a handful of professional athletes, um, some NFL players, a boxer, a wrestler, all in middle age, all who were uh, symptomatic, all who had extensive histories of repetitive brain trauma, the types of people who would likely develop this disease. And so what we did was we did some scans of their heads. And this is just one example of a former NFL player who is compared to a same age and size matched control. You don't have to be a neuroradiologist to see that this brain is yellow. <laughs> no, that this, <laughs> that this brain has had profound atrophy of the frontal and temporal lobes. This is a, a neat technique called diffusion tensor imaging. Those little spaghetti fibers, those are actual nerve fiber bundles coming out of the corpus callosum. That's what makes the connections between the hemispheres. This is cool science. We're able to look at these things while someone's alive. That's another former NFL player, another control. There's this incredible diminution of the connections between parts of the brain. That led us to be able to um, successfully compete for a wonderful NIH grant um, that I got last year um, to do another wonderful acronym, but this one better, uh, the DETECT study. This is actually quite striking because it was the first grant ever funded by NIH to study CTE, even though we've known about it since 1928. Hopefully, it's not the last. And what we're doing with this is we are bringing in 100 former NFL players to Boston, ages 40 to 69, all who played positions that were at the highest exposure to brain trauma, all of whom have symptoms before they come to Boston. We check to see if they have some symptoms that would be consistent with CTE. And then we're bringing in 50 same age elite athletes, predominantly Olympians, who played sports that would never have put them at risk for brain trauma, no history at all of hitting their heads for many things. And we're doing all kinds of extensive neuroimaging, like I showed you before. We're getting um, spinal fluid through spinal taps, lumbar punctures, to be able to measure. We can actually measure tau and amyloid. Amyloid's another protein that we see in Alzheimer's disease, to be able to distinguish the two. In fact, this week, I'm probably going to be sending off some of this um, extra cerebrospinal fluid to some colleagues who are at the incredible beginning of a technique to be able to measure the specific type of tau that I'm interested in. No one's, ever, no one's doing that anywhere else. We're doing electrophysiological studies. We're looking at genetics to be able to look at various genes that might 
put people at risk for this disease. And we're putting these poor guys through these extensive several hour psychiatric interviews and neurological exams and motor assessments and cognitive assessments. And hopefully from all of this, it will be the first step at least to develop what are called biomarkers, objective measures to diagnose the disease, to detect the disease. And so not only would we be able to detect it when people are symptomatic, but hopefully we'd be able to detect it before people have symptoms. So we can then treat it early before the brain starts to lose cells. And if we could do that, detecting it early enough by changing the course of the disease, by making it so the tau doesn't accumulate, we'll be able to pr basically prevent the symptoms from ever occurring. Other future research, we're doing some very neat things right now. We're, we're about to start using a special PET scan, first time ever, to look at tau in the brain of the living person. It's never been done before except in maybe a handful of people with Alzheimer's disease. With one, the people we're working with are just one out of two people in the world who are now starting to be able to, in humans, look at tau while someone's alive in the brain. So we have a couple grants right now under review to be able to start doing this with my NFL cohort. We're going to be looking at soccer heading. We already have started in Germany. We have a large group where we're going to be looking at kids age um, eight all the way up to professionals, elite soccer players, and look at the effect of heading. We're going to be starting some clinical trials, again looking more at genetics, specifically focusing on suicide, being able to detect what is associated with CTE and suicide, and then focusing more and more on the military, looking at the difference between traumatic brain injury symptoms, post-traumatic stress disorder, and now CTE. And then we'll be doing some additional animal modeling. This is my favorite animal model. <laughs> Those of you who can't see it from the back, it says, I read that story about dementia and former NFL players. Maybe we should reconsider this. We're going to be doing some prevention, making sure that people you know, don't continue to put themselves at risk. This is my favorite prevention. These are these Vikings. And it says on the bottom, it's a concussion, Sven. You're sitting out the next siege. We're going to be developing with uh, some colleagues better protective headgear, even though you can't truly prevent this stuff. But this is my favorite protective headgear study. And with that, just tell you about the funding that we have received so far for full disclosure. Uh, grants from NIH, uh, Boston University has been uh, able to give us some money at the beginning, the Department of Veterans Affairs. Some of you probably heard that the NFL had given us a million dollar unrestricted gift a couple years ago. The money's all gone, but it was completely unrestricted. It was not like tobacco type of thing where they could control what we're doing. In fact, um, I get into big fights with the NFL leadership about things that we do and say because they think that they can own us and we're not going to be owned. Um, JetBlue actually gave me some money to help fly some of our participants to Boston. The NFL Players Association likewise gave us some money, um, and, and et cetera. But this is what it's all about. These are the, these are the people who have really made the research happen. I'm just a, a player in this uh, incredible group of uh, talented um, uh, colleagues and research assistants and graduate students and fellows and you name it, but predominantly the thanks go to the um, family members and the participants themselves uh, who have allowed us to get this research going in the first place. And with that, um, again remind you that yeah, indeed I am a football fan. I'm not really a hockey fan, but that has nothing to do with the, the, the fights. It's, I just don't like hockey. I can't skate. Um, but it's all about protecting these games from youth on. It's all about making our games safer so we can continue them. But that's going to require changing the way we play these games dramatically so we can keep them going and keep them safe. So with that, thank you very much. So we have time for some questions and answers. Um, we're going to play uh, Phil Donahue here. Um, and 
uh, make sure to wait until the mic comes to you to ask your question. I was just wondering, have you already taken into account what the brain would look like, say, if somebody was a, a drug abuser versus what you're doing here? Are, do they end up looking similar and does that make it harder? Great question. Um, um, substances don't develop into CTE, um, whether it's narcotics or cocaine or steroids or other performance enhancing drugs. That's another question that people often ask. They do not me mechanistically have the ability to lead to this accumulation of tau protein and start this disease. So there's no link at all. And in fact, we see the same disease in people who had absolutely no exposure to any of those things and people who did have extensive. It, it's mechanistically, chemically not possible really, and we, there, there's been no evidence to suggest that it's there. Wait, wait. The, the other question I had was, when, I, when you were first going down all of the, the things that were the symptoms, yeah. all right, I have a son who has some of the symptoms of Asperger's, yeah. and I'm like looking at these things, I'm like, these are all the same symptoms oh, sure. of autism and Asperger's. What's going on there? Yeah. Do you, a, any yep. <clears throat> None of these symptoms of CTE or the symptoms of concussion, but let's not even do, deal with concussion. None of the symptoms of CTE are specific to CTE. You know, the brain is such an incredible thing. You know, it causes, it, it, it's responsible for us to do everything we do. And so if there's any problem with the brain, we're not going to be able to do those things as well. We're going to have alterations. We're going to be doing things slightly abnormal or a lot abnormally. And so the constellation of symptoms that are seen in CTE are somewhat unique to CTE, we think, but not completely. And so that's why we can't just rely on the symptoms. We also have to develop these biological markers, these objective biomarkers, to say this is likely CTE and not something else. But it, there's probably another question there, which is, have, do we think that there could be a relationship between other disorders and diseases and CTE, like Asperger's, like autism? Um, no, um, there, there, there shouldn't be any link at all. Another question. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the lecture today. It was really great information. Um, I have two teenage children. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> I feel the same way. Um, in my son's high school, they do something called baseline testing with mm -hmm. the kids, and my daughter, who's in middle school, yep. her um, soccer club does the same thing, where they give them a, a test on a computer under uh, normal uh, conditions, and then if they think they got a concussion, they bring them back to do the test to see if there's a, a big variance in the results. Yep. What are your thoughts on that baseline testing for the kids? So that study in Purdue that I mentioned before where they put the accelerometers in the helmets and they tested their cognition and the physiological functioning, that was baseline testing. It was impact, which is what your kids are taking because it's, it's ubiquitous out there. Um, from all different levels, from pros down to peewee, uh, baseline testing is becoming a very, very common thing. Um, and what it is, is it's a computerized assessment that a kid could either take at home, online, or in a group at school, or individually. And you take it before the season, with the idea being that if you then hit your head, you could see the, de the decline or the decrement between what you were like before and what you're like after. So you could then say, ah, this kid is not working too well right now. Let's continue to do repeat testing. And when he or she gets back up to their baseline level, that means they should be well enough to go. That's the concept. Um, so there's a, a few great things about that and a few not great things about it. One of the, the great things is that it makes sense to have something somewhat objective before so you can compare it to. Um, the problem is that it's not always objective because some kids and some pros and some college athletes learned how to successfully do poorly on the test at baseline so you wouldn't be able to detect a decline after they're hit because no one wanted to sit out. So that's one problem. The other problem is that 
it's too easy. It's too easy to do. It's too easy to rely on. It's a lot cheaper to do that than to have a good athletic trainer to be able to assess the kids before, during, after getting hit. Or a lot easier than making sure that every kid goes to a well-trained clinician in the community to then be examined thoroughly. The problem is that the diagnosis of concussion and the decision for return to play is a clinical decision. It requires a clinician, a well-trained clinician, to be able to measure not just the cognitive functioning on a computer test, but the symptoms, the neurological signs, the motor functioning, and make that decision. So it's part of the overall assessment, and it's a good part, and the really bad thing that happens too often in some situations is that it's relied on as the sole decision-making factor. Okay. I had read a couple months ago about, I think it was Riddle, um, the helmet maker. Yeah. They were uh, designing a helmet that if a, uh, a head collision occurs, it'll change color. Is that something you've heard about for schools? Yeah, so there's many, many different um, attempts at doing things to helmets to be able to, and not just football helmets, but predominantly football helmets, um, to do a f important new things like protect the brain a little bit better. So Rydell, Sh um, Sh uh, Sh Shoot, and another company, Zenith, have developed um, helmets that have like these shock absorbers in them to absorb some of the g-force before it gets to the skull and then to the brain. It can't do a lot though. It maybe can absorb a little bit. But now the companies are doing things that have accelerometers built into them that will measure the force and then either do something like change color so you know it's like the scarlet letter or um, <laughs> or send information to the sideline wirelessly. So someone on the sideline says, whoa, this was a G-force over 50. This person needs to come out. Those are, in, again, kind of in their infancy. They're going to be used. Um, and in fact, my colleagues at Sports Legacy Institute, um, Chris Nowinski and, and Bob Cantu, are right now about to unveil a whole program called the Hit Count. Um, which the idea is based on the pitching count. Uh, any of you do what I did, which was be a little league coach, where every pitch of a pitcher had to be counted on a little counter because of uh, some very minuscule chance that the kid is going to hurt their tendon in their elbow if they pitch too many times in a week or a day and they won't become a pro pitcher down the road. And it's not based on any research, how many it's going to be, and it's a little minuscule chance of it happening. And yet, every pitch around the country has to be counted, and the kids stop when they get to a certain count. Then we drop our kids off at Pop Warner football, or at high school football, <laughs> or at soccer even, and we say, hey, bye, honey, and they get 1,000 hits to the brain without anyone counting. So that's where some of those technologies are now going to be used too, and that's what uh, the hit count um, method is going to be to teach people how to make sure that we limit the amount of hits to the brain. In the back over there? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you talked about the PET scan being used to detect tau protein for the yeah. first time. Was, is there a problem tuning the machine to pick up the tau? Why is this just now being used? Yeah. Great question. Um, so the way these types of scans work is that um, a PET scan detects radioactivity. And so uh, the typical PET scan for the brain, you inject a, um, a, a labeled, a radio labeled um, glucose compound, okay? So it then will go in and attach to sugar, to glucose in the brain, and you can see it light up to be able to show the metabolism of the brain because glucose is needed for metabolism. And so you can see whether there's hypometabolic activity um, in various parts of the brain. Um, so anytime you use one of these techniques, you have to be able to label radioactively something that will attach to the thing that you're trying to measure. In this case, trying to 
figure out a way to label a compound that will attach to tau and light up if there's tau. That's been the kind of holy grail within the field of neurodegenerative disease because tau, for the most part, is inside the nerve cells. And so to get something, number one, that can cross the blood-brain barrier and get into the brain, number two, then, to cross the membrane and get into the cells and attach to tau, and then be able to light up enough to be able to be seen on the PET scan. It is such an incredible challenge, scientifically, to do that that people have been trying to do it for the last 15 years, and now finally uh, we're, we, we are hoping that we're actually there, and it's going to be inc an incredible game changer. So if you have a case where you already know there's been concussions and it's still a you know, relatively young person, what is the current studies and or recommendations to hopefully prevent or delay the onset of CTE? If anything. <laughs> but the first, I mean, th I mean, that's, that's the truth. We don't really know anything because of all those questions that still have yet to be answered. What makes logical sense is to reduce the overall exposure to brain trauma because that, you know, that's the only variable we currently know. So if we can reduce the overall exposure, then great. If we can reduce the amount of quick repetitive trauma, I think that's probably even better. And so making sure that someone does reach full recovery from one trauma before they get hit again is critical. Not just for CTE, but in youth aged around 18 and younger to prevent something called second impact syndrome, which can be fatal which is when uh, the brain is still actively recovering from the first trauma and the second trauma creates this incredible swelling um, and the kid can die. But more directly to your question, um, limiting the amount of exposure, whatever that might mean. But it doesn't mean that if you have a kid who's had a concussion that that's it, forget it, you can't do it anymore, you're done, I don't want you to get this disease 50 years from now. No, we don't know that yet. Just make sure they recover from the first one. It's a hard thing to have a little bit of knowledge right now and make important decisions, especially when it comes to our youth, where they're getting so much out of, so much positive stuff out of participating in so many of these activities. There's a question in the back over there. Oh, you're next. I've been watching you. You're, you're next. Okay. Again, thank you for the wonderful lecture. Uh, what about whiplash where there's no actual impact involved? Yeah, whiplash it can definitely cause concussion because we're not, that's why before when I was talking about the, the definition of a, of a concussion, it's not necessarily a hit to the head, it's a hit to the body or the head that results in the brain moving around. And so whiplash where you're going like this is huge for the brain, huge. So. Almost every time someone has whiplash, you have to consider that there might also be a concussion. No. Anyone on this side? <laughs> even though, even though the obviously very the different pathogenesis, the pathogenesis between CT and uh, Alzheimer's is obviously extremely different. Do you see, in terms of research with using uh, as far as CTE? Do you think any treatment, potential treatments might have benefits as far as what uh, Alzheimer's patients might have? Yeah, great question. And that's why I'm in this to begin with. I'm an Alzheimer's researcher. To be, you know, that's, that's the bulk of what I have been doing. And so when I started getting involved with this concept of CTE, same thing with Dr. McKee, it was because it could help us understand other diseases like Alzheimer's disease. And then we started learning they can flip as well. That what we've been learning about Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases can help us in our work with CTE. So what I, what I put up on the slide is the, the neuropathology comparing Alzheimer's with CTE. And 
Um, I won't belabor it, but just to give you kind of a primer, Alzheimer's disease has two proteins that go awry. One is called beta amyloid. That's that A, beta, A, and then the beta next to it up, up top. Um, and the other is tau. But in CTE, we don't see the A beta. We don't see the beta amyloid. So on the top, it's a normal brain under one microscopic um, uh, level and then even greater um, uh, enlargement. And in the middle, they're stained. All these brains are stained for both amyloid and tau. In the middle, you see with the CTE, you see the brown stuff up here is tau. All these things are too. But it predominantly kind of clumps together on the very surface of the cortex very superficial layers. And these things are those neurofibrillary tangles. But no tau, uh, no amyloid that would look like these red splotches. These are plaques of amyloid. So for a long time, the focus of treatment for Alzheimer's disease has been trying to reduce the amount of amyloid in the brain. And we're still trying to do that. But now, finally, there's been an attempt to try to reduce the amount of tau in the brain of Alzheimer's disease. And because Alzheimer's disease is such a huge potential market, the drug companies are really putting a lot of effort into trying to figure out how to reduce the disease, try to change the disease course. And so now there are treatments that are being developed that are specific to tau that we'll be able to use in our work with CTE. But the first step is for me to be able to diagnose CTE while someone's alive, at least as well as I can do in Alzheimer's disease. So what I described before in our approach to diagnose CTE with those imaging things and the PET studies and the lumbar punctures and the, all that type of stuff, that's all kind of exploiting what we've learned from Alzheimer's disease. It's the same type of techniques that we use now in Alzheimer's research that have led to the ability to diagnose Alzheimer's now during life pretty well. Now we're churning it to be able to use in CTE research. So it's going back and forth. What we learn from CTE will be able to help us with Alzheimer's and other diseases, and the things that, we're, that are already being developed for Alzheimer's can now be translated for CTE research. Have you ever done any studies on, uh, say, Olympic skiers, snowboarders, or competitors that do aerials and hard landings, or sometimes they miss their landings and they land on their head and so forth. Yes, they do wear helmets. Um, have you done any studies? And is the weather a factor, warm weather versus cold weather? And are females more susceptible than males for uh, head injuries? You want me to answer all those questions? <laughs> Let me, well, what do you say? <laughs> Let me start with some of the basics. Um, we would like to get more brains of women who have passed away to be able to get a better understanding of the disease in women, at least neuropathologically. We've had a handful of brains of, of women, including a skier, um, but it's too small a sample for us to know anything. In that longitudinal study, where we're looking at people every year of their life, that's including not 50% women, but something like 40% women. Because of the types of sports that are out there with a lot of repetitive brain trauma, there just aren't as many women involved, but around 40%. So we're going to try to find out something that way. Um, going back, though, to exposure, we do know that children, girls, have it appears greater number of concussions and more severe symptoms. Now, is that because girls will, are culturally brought up to talk about their symptoms more? It's, it, they're not as macho, so they can talk about it. We don't know. Is it that girls have less upper body strength and weaker necks, and so when they are involved in a collision, their necks do not protect their brains from going back and forth a lot. Are there hormonal things? We just don't know any of those answers yet. But from the numbers game, girls do get more concussions, possibly. But when it comes to developing the disease, we don't know. There have not been any confirmed cases um, 
of female athletes. However, like I said earlier, the brain has no idea what's hitting it. So in the literature and a couple of our cases, there have been, sadly, cases of confirmed CTE of women who were the victims of domestic abuse and whose heads were pounded too often. Just like there's also a case of a circus clown, a dwarf circus clown who was shot out of a cannon over and over again. There's also, sadly, cases of people with pervasive developmental disorders who were headbangers and um, who banged their head um, over and over again, and then when they passed away, their brains were found to have it. But aerial skiers, ski jumpers, downhill skiers, that's huge. Horseback riding is huge. Soccer is huge. All of these activities that result in repetitive trauma. But remember, it's not just the concussions. It's the subconcussive things. And so we need to think about what activities also result in a lot of mild hits over and over and over again. Microphone? I've done a lot of swimming in high school, diving. Yeah. I cannot tell you how many times people get headaches yeah. from doing the diving. And there, it even, I mean, obviously even the high divers, we're not talking about thousands of hits, we're talking about tens of thousands right. of hits. Uh, any thought yeah, about so, looking at So at when swimmers? we're trying to figure out who to include and who to exclude in our research studies, swimmers who never dived rep competitively, we allow. Divers, to me, is a high risk sport because of exactly what you say. Um, it is past closing time. Um, so thank you all very, very much for coming out. And go Terriers. <laughs>